What if we had special, practical, beautiful, handmade tools made from language, just the right language, to help us be more courageous in our everyday lives? Well, that's precisely what we're going for in this latest episode of Dale Byron's poetry podcast, A Fresh Glimpse of Knowing. This episode is actually called Secrets of Everyday Courage, and I want to start with a special quote. It goes like this. We must accept our reality as vastly as we possibly can. Everything, everything, even the unprecedented, must be possible within it. This is in the end, this is in the end, the only kind of courage that is required of us, the courage to face the strangest, most unusual, most inexplicable experiences that can meet us. Well, of course, that was the uh, famous poet, German poet Rilke, in uh, famous correspondence, which was published as Letters to a Young Poet, uh, written just about a hundred years ago. Timely? Well, I think it might be timely, certainly for our conversation about everyday courage today. Um, you know, uh, once the poet Stafford said that perhaps the cruelest thing ever is to know what happens, but to not recognize the fact. And so that's going to be one of the themes, I think, of being able to recognize what is happening, what is going on, and being able to meet those experiences with courage, and uh, no matter, as Rilke says, how inexplicable the experience might be. And of course, I don't know about you, but I think we are all running into, in these last years, some uh, quite strange, most unusual, and uh, inexplicable experiences. Now, in the first episodes of this podcast, and there have been three up until this fourth one, we focused on a number of ways in which we can use poetry to come into more balance and to come into more harmony with the natural world, with each other, and of course with ourselves. We've used a number of hard-headed facts in each episode and equally hard-headed poetry to delve into complex and sometimes very, very difficult territories. I'll actually have more to say about territories a little bit later today. These have been poems with sharp elbows, we could say, that can take care of themselves. Not just hothouse poems that can exist with uh, you know certain kinds of environments, but that can in- exist out there in the world, as it were. Often words, as it's been said, these poems, words from which there is no retreat. In other words, you say them and you can't go back. You can't unsay them. Now, speaking of courage, which is our theme today, uh, at the root of that word uh, is the Latin word for heart, core. So courage in its original in its original meaning is really to speak one's mind by telling all that is in our heart now these days that word courage has been mostly tethered to what we think of as heroic and brave deeds but today Uh, I want us to focus, we'll focus on what we are calling our ordinary or everyday courage. Uh, 
courage to examine, to know, and ultimately to follow our hearts. And as we're going to see, that's not always so easy or comfortable even. Courage to stand up and speak out. That's where it can get really uncomfortable. Courage to speak out honestly, respectfully, truthfully, every time we need to and have the chance to. As William Stafford once said, again, sort of pushing against the courage as a heroic act, he said this in a poem called Allegiances. He said, It is time for all the heroes to go home if they have any. Time for all of us common ones to locate ourselves by the real things we live by. So, here's to uh, all of us common ones attempting to be uh, courageous every day and attempting to find new tools for that courage. And speaking of that, the first poem, or tool that we uh, want to talk about today uh, is also from the great poet William Stafford, who we just quoted. This poem is called Serving with Gideon, and I think it really, you know, bears right into the subject we're talking about, everyday courage. It goes like this. Now I remember, now I remember, in our town, the druggist prescribed Coca-Cola mostly, in tapered glasses, and to the elevator man in a paper cup so he could drink it elsewhere because he was black. Now I remember, in our town, the druggist prescribed Coca-Cola, mostly, mostly in tapered glasses to us and to the elevator man in a paper cup so he could drink it elsewhere because he was black. Now we're going to find out a little bit later in this poem when it was set, and it happened to be set early in Stafford's life, which was the 1930s. And... uh, I remember in my own life, growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, which was kind of a big town in those days. It's more of a city now. But uh, I remember there was a store there, which I believe is still there, as I recall. Haven't lived in Charlotte for many years, but it's called Belk's, B-E-L-K-S, Belk's Department Store. And I remember very distinctly in my really early, early days, early memories uh, as a child in the 60s. And uh, I don't know quite how long this lasted, but I still have memories of there being a colored and a white water fountain. And also colored and white bathrooms. Now, my parents tended to be a little more progressive. My dad was from New England. My mother was from Virginia. So I didn't get a double-barrel batch of this, um, at least at home. But you can imagine growing up in that, as I like to say, that pickle juice. Um, uh, it's, uh, It's real. Talking about being real, it was real. So let's go on to the second poem. So I, my point is I can, uh, I can relate to what Stafford is saying here. Second stanza. And now I remember the legion. And now I remember the legion gambling in the back room. And no women but girls, old boys, old boys who ran the town. Well, they were generous to their sons or the sons of friends. And of course, I was almost one. Now we get in a 
uh, subtle or not so subtle way that uh, William Stafford was not among the in group in uh, in that Midwest town, small town that he grew up in. Actually, his parents, uh, his dad, struggled as so many did in the 30s, so they moved a lot. And uh, during those times, he lived in a lot of small towns. So here's the fourth stanza. I remember winter light closing its great blue fist slowly eastward along the street and the dark then deep as war arced over a radio show called the 30s in the great old USA. The great old USA in the 30s. The last stanza. Look down, stars. Look down, stars. I was almost one of the boys. My mother was folding her handkerchief. The library seethed and sparked. The library seethed and sparked. Right and wrong arced. And carefully and carefully I walked with my cup toward the elevator man. The library seethed and sparked, right and wrong arced, and carefully and carefully I walked with my cup toward the elevator man. In Stafford's later life, he uh, said this line in a poem, but he also talked about it in interviews. Um, He said he had the bitter habit of, of the forlorn cause. That's my addiction. And uh, he did. He took up causes. Uh, He was a conscientious objector in World War II and was interned uh, for three-ish years, all during the war, three or four years, during the last part of the war. And um, he uh, always took, um, in some ways, hard stances. Hard in the sense that World War II in particular was a very, very popular war. And um, um, anyway, it was a hard stance. And of course, the whole thing about the uh, racial issues uh, were in the 30s, particularly. Uh, you were pushing up against the stream if you had this attitudinal stance that William Stafford had. He said in another poem once, he said, I ranged the whole world in the dark to hammer on doors with my heart. I ranged the whole world in the dark to hammer on doors with my heart. What an image that is. What an image. (laughs) Ah, Talking about the forlorn cause, the cause that is so long, so hard, so mind-boggling, which I think for many of my colleagues and friends and loved ones, issues such as the uh, ecological issues that we're facing right now, today, Uh, Not to mention the racial issues that continue. These all seem so complex, so big, so difficult. Uh, But I think this poem, Serving with Gideon, is an artful, accessible tool for remembering our own courage, for coming back to our own heart and remembering what we intended and being able to speak up being able to take that paper cup over to the elevator man. And whatever issue that infers in this moment, uh, to be able to do that, to remember ourselves. And I love to think of that word in its, uh, if you think about what it's really saying, to remember, to put ourselves back together. Now, you know, um, I ran into some information uh, that I'm very intrigued with by uh, 
gentleman by the name of Dr. Robert Gilman, who's president of something called the Context Institute. Gilman is a very, from my standpoint, and I've just run into his work, very progressive thinker and was one of the pioneers in the in the whole idea of sustainability. Very bright man. And one of the ideas that I picked up, at least initially, from looking at his material, their material, is this idea of, um, uh, I guess you would, you would call, he calls them territories and maps. And if you think about it, he would say that a human being, for example, uh, if you think of each of us as a territory with vast expanses of complexity, and that what we could do is that we could overlay a map on ourselves or any other human being, and it would be one way to look at that territory. And different maps would be used for different things. I just found it a very um, insightful way to look at complex things like human beings or a complex things thing like uh, the territory of racial prejudice in the USA in the 1930s. And you can imagine that this poem is a map over that territory which shows both the way it was uh, in, in, uh, in, in certain many ways and also an aspirational look, which is what William Stafford is also talking about. Um, Now, uh, what we like to do, or what I like to do in the podcast, and I talk about this, is that we want to frame each of the subjects that we um, work with here, we want to frame it with some logical, linear facts or questions, some prose, basically, because... As you may recall, the idea, uh, one of the organizing ideas of this podcast, of this whole effort and project, is to blend the logical, linear, intellectual facts and ideas, to blend those with the emotional, with the nonlinear, um, with the intuitive and imaginative parts of ourselves, with the idea that if we can bring those things together, and poetry does a wonderful job of that, if we can bring those things together, then we can come up with ways of being in the world, ways of living that are going to be more skillful. So my logical linear questions... Uh, for today, that part of the podcast, would be these. What is your heart saying to you right now? If you think about it, if you feel about it, what is your heart saying to you right now? What ideas are coming up? What thoughts? And you can think about that Rilke quote about some of those thoughts, you know, being... uh, Outside, outside the pale or beyond the pale, to use that old cliche. So what is your heart saying to you? The second one, the prose, logical, linear uh, question, would be, in what direction are you being tugged by what your heart is saying? You know, it's interesting, I've often thought, that the mind, the intellect, is so amazing at helping us with understanding how to do something. You know, the ABCs, the techniques, the how to do something. But it is only the heart, it is only the heart that uh, points to what we should do and perhaps why we should do it. We get into a lot of trouble, I think, as a species, when we forget the heart. When we forget the heart. So the third question is, like the protagonist in any good story, what part of this request, in other words, what's your heart saying to you, 
in, the second question, in what direction are you being tugged? And then third is, um, like the protagonist in any good story, what part of this request, what part of what your heart is saying to you scares you the most? You know, um, there's a great uh, quote I heard once. It says, it's not the things we fear. It's not the things we fear. It's the mother of the things we fear. So maybe that's what we're talking about here. And these uh, logical questions bring up the um, theme, back to the theme of what pickle juice, and of course that's my uh, corny term sometimes for poems, the pickle juice, what poems do we need, do you need to remember your path of courage, to remember your heart, to know what's in your heart, and to be able to speak it and live it. So let's look at a different tool for remembering, getting at courage, getting at the courage needed for another ongoing challenge of war and violence. This is a poem by the great poet Pablo Neruda, and this particular uh, translation from the original Spanish uh, is done by Alistair Reed, and the poem is called Keeping Quiet. It goes like this. Now we will count to twelve. Now we will count to twelve, and we will all keep still for once, for once, on the face of the earth. Let's not speak in any language. Let's stop. Let's stop for a second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Hmm... I love those first two stanzas. It just mm, sort of grabs us and says, hey, remember what silence and stillness can do, especially when we've been running here and there and kind of going crazy with what's happening in the world. I love that image of a sudden strangeness. And if we think back to our Rilke quote, doesn't it really get back to that where Rilke is saying that we need to be able to deal, to deal. We need to have courage enough to deal with strange things that show up in our lives. Sudden strangeness. So Neruda goes on in the third stanza and says it like this. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the men gathering salt would look, and the man, excuse me, and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands. Can't you just see that image of the man, the person, looking down at their hurt hands and what it's like to gather salt with hurt hands? He goes on, those who prepare green wars, those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade doing nothing. What I want, what I want, should not be confused with total in activity. Life, life is what it is about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. 
I think those lines, um, somebody says, uh, it's been said that some lines in a poem, that we can travel in those lines for thousands of miles. And I think that these last lines in the poem, there are a few more after this, but these last lines are so powerful. He says, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us, can teach us, as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now, I'll count up to 12, and you keep quiet, and I will go. Now, for me, this poem does not mince words. Talking about a poem with sharp elbows. Talking about a poem that can make its own way in the world talking about a poem that can remind us as we pull this poem out of our first aid kit to remind us of what we intended to remind us of what is in our heart to remind us to speak up even when that speaking up may be uncomfortable and difficult for ourselves and for others. Because even though I think this poem does not mince words, it also does it in a way that for me feels respectful, feels compassionate, and in a strange way, back to Rilke's words, and in a strange way, this poem even feels hopeful. Because as I think we're more and more recognizing uh, a line that uh, William Stafford once said. He said, every war has two losers. Every war has two losers. So, um, Just as Pablo Neruda in those last lines when he said, Now I'll count up to twelve, and you keep quiet, and I will go. So just as Pablo Neruda, it is time uh, for me to go. It is time for us to end this episode. Um, But I don't necessarily want you to be quiet, other than maybe to reread this poem. It's available in many places, and uh, you could certainly do worse than going out and buying some Pablo Neruda poetry, but you can also find this on the web. Um, brilliant poem, and remember again, it's, uh, um, it's uh, called Keeping Quiet, Pablo Neruda. And uh, after your period of quietness, quietness, I should say, and after you feel like you have come back to yourselves. And remember, you can do this over and over again. And I think my own experience with my own courage, my own courage is very flir- uh, fleeting. I was going to say flirting. I, I guess I, could, I flirt with my courage from time to time. I wish I could be more courageous. I wish I could follow my heart more. And yet what I find is that as I have more beautiful language, these poems and others, that remind me of what I intend, that remind me of what it is in my heart, what my heart is saying to me, reminds me of the scary things my heart sometimes asks me to do to speak up, to take the paper cup over to the elevator man. And again, or whatever version of that 
is required in the moment. So that I leave you with. I'm going to ask you, of course, if you're enjoying the podcast, please send it along to some others that you think might enjoy it as well. And also, if you subscribe uh, wherever, on Apple or wherever you get your podcast, then you'll get notifications um, of when new podcasts come. And they're going to come at about a 10-day rate or so. And um, Because I know that what all good podcasts, especially when they're starting out, uh, they're, they're striving to reach the right people that would say after they hear one, yes, yes, that was helpful. Yes, I like that. Okay, well, until next time, next episode, you take good care of yourself.